Uh, we are the Arctic Study Center uh, North in Anchorage. Our partner is the Anchorage Museum, who has hosted our program since 1994. And I, I really appreciated Bill's uh, focus on what the the impact that you can have from a museum base uh, on communities if you establish an effective and broad collaborative network. And as Bill mentioned, um, we could see that the contemporary struggles of Alaska Native communities uh, certainly are reflected in difficult health and social conditions, but also symptoms of cultural loss, and I would include the decline of indigenous languages and arts. And museums have resources uh, for uh, working with communities on uh, reversing those losses. And we that is our main focus. We're museum-based cultural heritage programs. And they are especially effective if you can cast a wide network of involvement. We have had uh, the uh, exhibition here opened in 2010 called Living Our Cultures, Sharing Our Heritage, the First Peoples of Alaska. That features Smithsonian collections, both from National Museum of Natural History and National Museum of the American Indian, uh, over 600 pieces that were selected in Washington through uh, study, collaborative study with elders and advisors who traveled to DC to look through the thousands of objects that are at those museums uh, to select the collection and document it so that it could be displayed here. And I'll, I'll be talking about that, that exhibit here a little bit more. Uh, and, but having the exhibit uh, is not, that's not the end of it. In fact, it was just the beginning of the opportunity because the exhibit is a community resource for for heritage study and revitalization. And uh, so we have been really doing uh, everything we could think of to make it be a resource, to make it be a venue for creative uh, teaching, uh, documentation of culture, creation of educational materials and languages and arts. And so those are the kinds of uh, programs that we're going to speak about briefly. Don has, uh, uh, who is the assistant curator and longtime uh, cultural specialist and program manager here uh, for the Arctic Study Center in Alaska, uh, put together this uh, slide program. And uh, at her suggestion, we wanted to start with a uh, the short video that Sarah mentioned. This features our material traditions program. This is a recent series of museum collections based uh, residencies, artist residencies, and workshops uh, with Alaska Native artists, students, and communities, and with the goal of helping to rebuild uh, distinctive and endangered Alaska Native arts. And the one, uh, what you'll see here feature is our recent workshop and residency on using seal intestines to make uh, clothing. So it's called Sewing Gut. So Sarah, you, if you can roll it, that would be great. Before he died, my uncle was seen hunting in March. I thought it was winter when we used to have cold weather. Um, I, as soon as he put that on, you know, he started feeling the warmth. Because that's natural. That's natural. I grew up seeing flowers and seal. This is seal, mm -hmm. bearded seal. Taking out intestine, seal intestine, and after you peel it from the membrane, then you can take it from that side. You don't put your needle through on the side. You 
We didn't really get the visuals, but uh, we had some yeah, we we could see the visuals pretty well. I could I could see and hear it very well. Did did other people? Were you able to see it and hear it? Yes. Okay, good. It, we just got a few of the images. It didn't actually play as a video up here, but I'm glad uh, that at least some of you could uh, see the see the film. So that. That was a, a presentation of the uh, Cell and Gut Workshop, and that one was very interesting. You saw the uh, students involved, um, so there's a younger cohort of artists who was learning from these experienced uh, master artists, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, this program later. That does include taking this program out to uh, communities as well. So if we get the next slide, and the next one. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, our our start with all of this began with work on the Lindner Sharon Heritage Exhibition, and you see uh, an image here of the gallery that is in Anchorage. Um, there, and on the left um, is a, an image from our the research phase of all of this. There were uh, seven uh, reverse expeditions. We uh, call them of Alaska Native advisors and elders going to Washington to study the pieces. This is Peter Jack and Clarence Jackson uh, looking at a Clinkett and hat in the NMAI, uh, National Museum of American Indian Collection area. And then on the right, the gallery itself, it's, it's arranged with these tall glass cases, introductory videos that are introduced people uh, to the different cultural regions, uh, spoken by people from those areas, and then you see the pieces on uh, display. And it's kind of a cultural geography of Alaska arranged from north to south. And you're looking at the Simshian uh, case here at the end. Uh, so could we have the, and this, and this exhibit, as I say, it's an exhibit, but it's also, uh, you could call it a visible storage or study collection as well. And that's the way we use it. So next slide, please. <clears throat> When you uh, come into the exhibit, uh, you will see all of the work that we did, uh, the research work that we did with elders and advisors, uh, and is accessible through the touchscreen interactives in the exhibition. Here you see some people using those in the gallery. And then the same information is on the website, Alaska Native Collections, sharing knowledge. And for every single piece in the exhibition, there's high resolution imagery, there's a uh, lot of great, you know, historical, cultural information. Uh, there are transcripts of the elders' discussions about many of these pieces available on that site. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> uh, one of the programs that we've undertaken here is uh, focusing on language. And we've had a series of language seminars. 
It takes advantage of the design of the exhibition. Uh, you see on the right, um, Merlin Kanuka and Ralph Lepatiki from St. Lawrence Island looking at pieces from their area that have been taken out of the cases. So the pieces easily come out of the cases and we remount them on this study cart and uh, we can then take this into our seminar room, our cultural consultation room. And on the left, um, you see uh, the Inupiaq uh, language seminar, fluent speakers from the region discussing for a week, um, discussing the objects from their area, totally in Inupiaq. We record uh, these sessions and then use this material to create classroom language learning materials. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so here are some of the uh, products that have come out of that particular program. These are language and culture video lessons. And the DVDs are on the left. We also present this material online uh, to maximize accessibility. And for each of the discussions about the different selected objects, uh, there are uh, group discussions and then focused language learning lessons that are transcribed in the, in the film uh, and in, in translated into English, transcribed into the language. And then on the right, you see associated materials that students would use in bilingual classroom with the teacher. This would be, this is a student lesson about the drum from St. Lawrence Island and starting off with introductory vocabulary that students will hear in the film. And there's quite a bit of preparation uh, with this type of material. Then they watch the film and then there's follow-up review uh, vocabulary that was learned. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, using it in discussion, trying to have some classroom discussion. So we see this as a, a, this is very experimental, but I think it's been a successful prototype in using museum collections as the basis for dialogue and for language teaching. Okay, so next. Is that? So uh, this is Dawn here now. Um, so in our next phase, our community outreach shifted to workshops focused on key at-risk cultural heritage objects with few present-day practitioners. And some of this shift came from um, listening to the artists and community members that we'd worked with for over a decade on the exhibition, that this was really a priority for their communities to work to document and revitalize these practices. And you'll see on the left-hand side, um, Athabascan snowshoe making workshop, and on the right, Aleutian Island Bentwood hat making. And this program included partnering master artists with apprentices, and as you can see, artists also shared their work with school children and museum visitors. Next slide. Now the result of, of, of this program was also um, educational instructional videos. And these videos provide um, cultural overviews and, um, and detailed instructions on actually how to make a Bentwood hat that would be useful for um, community workshops and artists instructing others. Um, and we hoped one day to have additional support for editing the snowshoe videos and also for creating class classroom curriculum because um, it's, it's a really great potential opportunity to meet state standards and facilitate the use of materials that are culturally relevant as educational resources for Alaska Native communities. Next slide, please. And then from there, again, um, really listening to the feedback from participants and from community members, we extended this program to be focused on heritage materials that have fewer or no practitioners and what we call our material traditions program. And that consists of artist residencies and community workshops. And um, these programs are, are ones that we, we work with advanced and novice artists. And so far in these, we've covered how to process and use porcupine quills salmon skin, steel intestine, walrus ivory, and cedar wood for whistles. And in addition to educating school children and museum visitors, um, we've also included along the way museum staff, and in particular conservation staff from <clears throat> the National Museum of the American Indian, National Museum of Natural History, and the Anchorage Museum. And then also, I'll reference this later, through some online video conferences, um, conservators at um, two different conservation schools in the lower 48 who don't have opportunities to learn from or work directly with indigenous peoples. 
Um, and then for the 2016 program, um, we're working on cedar bark twine basketry, and um, that's a program that came about when community members from Metlakatla, who participated in one of our programs, came to us and asked to partner with them. And um, so that was a great outcome from the outreach um, that we've been doing. And um, this program is going to be expanded again, and we're going to include um, field work covering materials harvesting and processing, and then also language documentation, both of those in source communities. Next slide, please. Now, the outcome of this program has, again, been educational instructional videos, um, three of which have been produced so far and are available in print and online. We find it very important to include things in print because there's um, often very poor if, if, and also no internet service in some of the rural Alaskan communities. Um, and we have two more on the way um, for um, uh, two more programs that we've completed. Um, and here again, we also hope to have additional support at some point to create cross classroom curriculum. Next slide, please. And there is also other ways that we support additional cultural work um, through the collection that we have here. And that's by working with communities and artists through things like exhibit collections research, which has been conducted by different Alaska Native organizations on their own projects, including on the top you see a, a group from Chugachmut who did a research visit for um, one of their programs. And then on the right you can see um, the Cook Inlet Tribal Council had a, a couple of research visits here to um, do some work for their video game, Never Alone. Um, and then another way is uh, through uh, um, bringing in emerging Alaska Native artists to research the collections, which we started last year. And on the bottom, you can see on the left, Inupiaq performance artist, Allison Warden, and Clinkett Weaver, Ricky Tagadan on the right. Um, we've also added um, uh, collections research visits for local university classes. And um, these programs also are really ready to expand to achieve greater impact through supporting more communities and more artists, uh, many of whom teach in their own communities, again, extending that impact. Next slide, please. We also um, support additional collections outreach through a lecture series um, with Alaska Native culture bearers, artists, and scholars that link museum collections to their present day work. Um, you can see two examples of participants there on the left. And on the, on the right, um, we've also created a youth outreach program that started last year with a program called Skate Art, and that worked to link indigenous artists and Alaska Native professional artists and art forms and museum collections with at-risk teenagers um, participating through partnerships with local organizations. And we have another one slated for this summer, um, Mural of Art, and we're bringing up um, to um, Salt River Pima um, artists from Arizona to work with a local um, Unangak African American artist here with some students coming up next month. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'll jump back in. Uh, this is Aaron. So as much as possible, we uh, we document and produce materials from our programs and make them available online and in print so that they can have an impact beyond the individuals who are participating uh, to reach out to more Alaskan communities and nationally. Uh, although one of the things that I'm struggling with and you know aspire to is a more uh, kind of integrated uh, website um, that would have a broader reach. We have our material is now spread out over several different uh, websites, and on the right you even see our our YouTube uh, playlist with a lot of our films. Uh, next slide, please. It's, this is the last one. Oh, that's the last yeah. one? So, and then, as Bill mentioned, we've also been able to uh, do some live online programs. We've, we've connected with the Smithsonian's uh, Curious program, um, uh, with uh, the conservation learning programs that Don mentioned at Winter Tour uh, and UCLA, uh, getting students involved there meeting online anyway or through video conference meeting these artists. And uh, we are continuing to try to produce educational curricula. I think we've seen uh, you know, some real impact firsthand from these programs. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback and support. Uh, and we have been doing this for uh, a decade. 
I think we're well positioned and you know building on the kind of partnerships that are uh, here through IARPIC and uh, others that we've been working with to expand the reach of these programs uh, and to increase their impact. And so uh, we are very optimistic about that and hope that we can contribute to these goals that we're talking about today of improving health and well-being in us. So thank you for the chance to uh, present and thank you for putting together the great presentation. Yeah, thank you, Aaron and Don. That's that's a great overview. Um, I was going to ask a little bit, you know, if you had a, a little bit more to say about the impact. Um, you know, I, we know that there has been a lot of um, impact around the state of these programs. You see these artifacts on billboards and shops and different things like that. But I'm just wondering, you know, if if you might have a few more things to say from the point of view of, of villages and you know, groups that have been involved in these things, uh, what, uh, you know, if there's any other measures, because as I was talking with uh, Dorothy this morning earlier about NIH uh, and their interest in these kind of projects too, and a lot of these things are going to depend on being able to find measurable results and so forth, and maybe Dorothy might have a few comments to make about that. But first, um, I, do you have any? Do you have any other exam, Some examples. I mean, we're we're also thinking about these 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 social problems that people are experiencing too. And you know, other than some awareness of traditional culture and some pride developing in things that people did not think much about, especially the younger people, how that's uh, how these things are. You know, maybe changing you know attitudes or uh, social conditions. Well, thank you, Bill, uh, for that question. And my view is that the energy for all this is actually out in the communities and the best thing that can happen is that when we we plan a seed by doing one of these programs uh, and then we see that follow-up uh, cultural workshops heritage programs uh, come after them but with local talent local funding uh, and uh, you know uh, we are starting to see that and uh, that's I think I think in general you know we we are uh, hoping that what we can do is just plant some seeds that get nurtured uh, locally. We, we there's the two of us here. We have these wonderful resources if we can use this for inspiration. Uh, and Don, maybe you would maybe say a little bit about it too. We we do uh, there have been follow up workshops inspired by what we do. Yeah and. Um... And then the, the first thing I, I, I'd like to say is, as I still remember vividly, the first time I saw um, a group of, ch of, of young artists working with a master artist, and they had a copy of one of the Smithsonian publications that had photographs of objects, and it was falling apart because of how much they're referencing those object images. And it, you know, in a way, it kind of broke my heart that they didn't really have the opportunities to see the real thing, because every time you talk to community members, seeing the real thing is completely different. You know, because in their belief system, um, all objects are animate. You know, in Inupiaq is called Inua, and Yupik is called Yua. And so the, the value of seeing and handling the real thing is just, it's hard to measure and really has a great impact on every person that has that opportunity. And they, they continue to speak about that. Um, one of the things um, Aaron mentioned was that there have been um, additional programs held in communities that were inspired by ours. And, that's happened for fish skin and it's happened for sea mammal intestine. Um, but there's two things that are going on with that. A lot of these small communities don't have a cultural center. They don't have staff and resources in their community to put on one of these programs. And that's why they're really excited and enthusiastic about joining in ours because of our ability to organize it and bring it to their community. Um, they, they really usually don't have those kind of resources. And even in a place like Nome, Alaska, that has more resources than many, I was surprised to learn when we went there for our uh, ivory community class that there hasn't been ivory carving classes there for students to attend because they've relied on University of Alaska to provide um, class that, those sorts of classes. And they don't have a way to work around working with restricted materials, <clears throat> which we do because we only allow indigenous artists to work with restricted materials. and if you know, non-native students participate, we use alternative materials. 
So, you know, we had students from high school students to a woman in her 60s that were thrilled to have the opportunity to have a class like this because they've never been able to do that in their own community. And I do, and I, I think a key concept is identity as well. And it's interesting uh, to me to see the high level of response to this kind of opportunity for for young people um, who may have maybe lost the opportunity to learn these uh, traditional arts, to learn the language, and then here's a door that opens up, and they get very excited about it. This is extremely meaningful. And uh, I, I remember one of the uh, students who took part in the snowshoe uh, class. He said, "He said I, he said I, I do this. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of unusual in my age group that I do this, but the other kids are starting to look up to me because they respect that I'm interested in this and I'm learning. Uh, and so you kind of get people like that who you think, you know, this has really changed this person's life. I think, uh, and but." That is the person who's going to you know extend the impact. Great, great, good comments. So, Dorothy, could you say a little bit from your point of view and from the from another agency and and working? Your Dorothy's an anthropologist. She works at NIH, uh, and she's had a lot of experience with uh, projects like this uh, in the Southwest and also nationally. She's uh, she's a gatekeeper for some of the the uh, proposals that come into NIH, uh, and so she's very aware of this. Um, Dorothy, do you have a, something you'd like to say? Um, well, I think that this is really, it's really um, exciting, the kinds of feedback you're getting from people. And so one of the, one of the, for, from participants, I mean, and one of the things that Bill and I spoke about this morning is how do we take this information and put it in a form that, um, would be acceptable to the NIH. There are other people from federal agencies on the call, and Roberto, you're at NIMH. Um, you know, um, it's difficult from our perspective to, um, it's difficult from the NIH perspective to make a connection between the experiences that you're describing and, and health and well-being. And so for those programs to really engage scientists at NIH, because this is such a biomedical research facility, um, the links have to be much more concrete than they might be for other people. Um, for example, from people from the EPA might uh, have a better time, an easier time understanding the connection between things that happen with the the animal life and so forth in a community and climate change and those kinds of things or oil spills and um, the effect on, on the natural resources of, of an area. At the NIH, the focus has been very much on the mechanisms that underlie disease and disease risk. And um, so there are very few institutes at the NIH, which is a large conglomerate of 27 institutes and centers. There are very few institutes that take a more holistic view. What you're talking about, what you're describing in your project, is really taking a holistic view at all the things that are integrate, need to be integrated for a person to feel healthy and for a community to have a sense of well-being. And, and you know, from, from my perspective, how to capture that in a research sense um, there's a tension. There's a tension between what you all are doing and what Bill is doing and the kinds of things um, that the NIH typically funds. That said, there are some wonderful projects that are being done in Alaska looking at native, uh, at, at cultural reintegration and what it means to learn the practices, learn the traditional ways of approaching animals in hunting environments. Um, what do you do after you have killed a seal and, and how do you thank the seal for giving his life uh, for being food and those kinds of things. For getting opportunities for you to learn about those practices in a way that they have not had in the past and the strength of these cultural reintegration activities in terms of providing supports 
um, that are protective, protective from a substance use and abuse and protective from suicide threat and those kinds of things. So uh, to me, it's an exciting opportunity to hear what you're doing and to try to think more broadly about how can we link this kind of work and this model for work to projects that would uh, be able to evaluate the effectiveness of these as as interventions in to produce healthy, integrated lives. Does that make sense at all? Uh, it does to me, Dorothy. Uh, although you know, of course, it's it's, uh, and I appreciate it's coming from a a very different angle on all of this. We, um, I, I do, I appreciate your what you said about cultural reintegration, um, the way this can be, uh, I suppose, a, a kind of intervention. I've never thought of it that way, but to um, that is linked to to help, especially for young people. We have never had any any thought about how to measure this. I mean, I, I, the thing is that you are then, you're talking about um, studying people's uh, reactions uh, and health, et cetera. That is human subjects research that we have never thought of integrating into our programs. But I suppose, um, and I don't think I would want to, but I, I could see uh, possibly someone coming from the uh, from NIH or NIMH looking at the Im impact of heritage programs in communities or you know case study of some kind <clears throat> where maybe our material would turn up or you know we would possibly have had some influence. Well, I think that I think that there are people who are in your area in Alaska, um, native researchers, who are doing some of this kind of work. For for me to go in and do it uh, would be a, a cultural intrusion that would likely be objectionable and you know understandable. I think you made a re make a really good point about human subjects research because, um, from our perspective, that's pretty much. That's pretty much what we fund and and what we do is human subjects research, but it but um, one of the one of the projects that I've been engaged with, as I told Bill this morning, has been a project with Gwen Isaac at the Smithsonian as well, uh, looking at native health and culture, and we're trying to find ways of bridging ways of thinking about and talking about health research, and that's really what we're engaged in in this in this meeting right now. How do we how to reach across those silos and bridge them. What can we do on our side to soften those boundaries? And what can you do on your side? You know what I mean? Um, it's a difficult, it's a difficult problem. And um, I'm not willing to say, well, because it's, because you don't do human subjects, because we do do human subjects, there's an impasse. I, I understand you're not wanting to do it. Because it it adds a layer of complexity that's um, time consuming, expensive, and frequently feels insurmountable. Well, it, I, that's I, okay. So I appreciate that too. And I, to me, this is an interesting dialogue because, um, in a way, you you talked about tension. Uh, I think the idea of human subjects research, which is um, you know definitely a scientific approach to measuring health impacts, um, is. Uh, it's really in a different universe in a way from uh, cultural heritage, you know, collaborative cultural heritage work. Of it's the absolutely. And so it's a very different model. And so I, I, would, I could see that connecting the two um, would be challenging. And I appreciate the chance to, you know, to think about that a little bit because uh, it's just, you know, the contrast is, is an important one. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this conversation as well because it changes it changes my thinking and it makes me think more broadly about how we can uh, shape research on our end to credit traditional knowledge and to um, treat other ways of knowing and other ways of learning and thinking about health and 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 studying health and and creating um, tools for people to. For for us to learn from how people help themselves, actually, 
because it's not anything that we need to teach other people. It's what what Alaska Natives need to teach us, right? It's the the direction of learning is in our direction, I believe, and in I don't many want cases. To overextend the discussion, but I'll just maybe if I could make one one point. Um, Please. That, well, the just in terms of um, the the Smithsonian's IRB, the Institutional Research Board at the Smithsonian. You know, in considering the foundation of our work here, I talked to them early, very early on about if we're doing, if we're going to people for to ask them about indigenous knowledge, if we're interviewing them, their knowledge about these objects or about arts or about oral tradition, or I do a lot of oral tradition and archaeology. <clears throat> all of those types of collaborative research where you are going to indigenous people as experts, not as subjects, but as experts. Right. Um, that is not considered to be human subjects research, and I thought it, that was very uh, interesting to me, and I agreed with that decision. That was the IRB's decision in general relating to our work. Uh, so I just thought that it created this. Uh, on the other hand, when when we go to talk to people about their uh, understandings of health and illness and their practices around health and illness, it's really tapping their personal experience and it taps things that may put them uh, at risk in one way or another. And so it, it is not something that could, would not be considered human subjects. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Yeah. So I really appreciate the uh, your perspective. I mean, this is, I hadn't thought of it that way before and I, it's a, uh, thank you for that. Are there some other comments? Uh, I don't want to, you know, this is important, but we have other people in the program here too as well. Uh, so I don't want to shut anybody up at all, but if there's some other perspectives that people who have been listening to this exchange want to, you know, would like to chime in, please, please do. Bill, this, this is Ed Washburn. Yes, Ed. And there's a lot I'd like to talk about in this, but we don't have much time. But the one thing that I think that would appeal to the broader audience here is that in the last few weeks since the Arctic Council has been on my radar screen and I've been pursuing the One Health, I've been looking for the center of gravity across the federal government for this type of thing. And I, I can't find it, and which makes me think we need to, to create that center of gravity for this kind of discussion so that there is more of a coordinated effort and people know where there is a place to go to talk about all this stuff. And so far in my mind, One Health comes the closest to capturing that, but maybe there's something else out there. Well, that's, yeah, in, in a sense, that's what the communities group has been working toward. Uh, I don't think you've been part of our group before that, but it was pretty much focused on these milestones and, and, and other issues and health was sort of a component, but but it seems to have risen pretty much to the top now. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we're hoping that this this ball does roll down the down the road and gets bigger and and includes more people. And certainly, you know, One Health is a is a great great focus because of the uh, you know the environmental aspects of it, and everything. So, what we're kind of interested in is trying to see if we can't broaden this uh, in some way. So, uh, let's keep working on that. I have one suggestion. As I look at this map of the National Science and Technology Council and all the various committees and subcommittees, there's something called a task force on Ebola resistant S and T that is a short term project. I would think this might qualify as a task force to at least get it uh, get some structure to it and get it on a uh, a scale that has a little more formality to it because i can I think that the Ebola response will be probably going away shortly. Yeah, um, I don't quite know how to how to handle that, but um, it's something we Bill, can talk. Yeah. Bill, this this is Sarah, and IARPIC does have the ability to stand up um, working groups that are short term addressing particular issues. We have one on model reanalysis going now, and they're concluding work on a white paper. Um, so why don't we raise this at staff group meeting and and see if it takes uh, takes hold? Good idea. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ed. We'll keep in touch, and, and, and thanks for sending those papers. Uh, anybody who wants to um, uh, 
Uh, and you might consider put, posting those on the uh, uh, community's, uh, you know, uh, website for IARPIC or making those some of those things available. Maybe they're already there somewhere. Okay. Uh, Ed, I can help you with that. This is Sarah. I'll, I'll okay. reach out to you and give you a hand. Thank you. Any any other comments? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. This is uh, Moses Gervanov. Uh, I'm from the Aleutians, and I'm pretty familiar with art myself. And hi, Ed, by the way. Um, I kind of look at art, uh, uh, native art here in Alaska as, uh, in terms of the usage. Would, uh, I think it's a natural and a cultural resource. Natural in terms of the artwork that they're creating now, uh, for example, the, uh, the visor and stuff, had a practical use for it, whereas now it's considered artwork. Uh, is there does something over time change in terms of being something that was antique or old as a tool that was used in the past but uh, has been upgraded today or something to that effect? Does that make sense? Absolutely, that happens all the time, and maybe Aaron could speak about that. Well, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, that's an interesting comment, and I think we've seen uh, the different ways that. The Smithsonian and other museums um, look at these pieces. Uh, we understand them as art, um, as out of respect for their deep cultural meaning. Um, these pieces that are in our collections and that people make today. Um, and I think maybe you're you're onto something in thinking about part of that is that these pieces are um, they have formal uses. They have ceremonial uses, they have uses that are about rediscovery of cultural connections, um, rather than being everyday items that people were out wearing in a kayak. Um, so they, they, have, uh, they have a different status, I think, both from the point of the view of the museums and, and from communities. And uh, so I think the meaning is deepened. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and I guess I want to thank Aaron and Don a lot for this presentation and for stimulating this discussion. Um, th we thought this was a good way to, to introduce, uh, you know, this whole area of heritage and cultural uh, resources and things like that. And I, I'd like to focus on that, you know, as we move down in the future, at least the Smithsonian, is, it's an area that we can serve and maybe connect with other agencies. Uh, because of the uh, the Anchorage office and the work they're doing, this is a might be something that we can can push forward and hope that we can find some ways, uh, as Dorothy's mentioned, to to bridge some gaps and to join some. You know, we may have some difficulties uh, in the in how the how the agencies are structured, but there are many people who are from other agencies, uh, like the Park Service, who are not here today, uh, who have similar kinds of programs and interests. Uh, uh, with culture and, and how that might be used for uh, rejuvenation, cultural rejuvenation, and so forth. 